Um, welcome everyone to our bill analysis workshop, part of a series of workshops to help um, the public, our members and supporters better understand the legislative process. So last time we did a general overview of the process and today we're gonna to dive a little deeper into specific legislation to better understand how it works. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Bob Howe, our lobbyist and um, key presenter tonight to lead us through this workshop. All right, well, um, hello everybody. My apologize for, um, for the delay on my end. So, uh, I have represented the Sierra Club now for three or four years. Been representing clients at the State House for 40 years. Prior to that, I served in the main House of Representatives and uh, I live in the town of Brunswick. Now, Matt, uh, do you want to allow me to share my screen? Yeah, you should be able to, you're a co-host, so you should see right. that screen button. So tell me, the first thing, uh, I, are you seeing my what I'm seeing on my screen, which is the legislative report for Sierra Club? Not yet. Okay. Is it? Um, is there something? Is there something I have to do to accept? Uh, no, you are a co-host, so you should be able to just click okay. that green button. Share. Voila. There we go. Okay. So um, what you're looking at is the report I put together for the Sierra Club for bills I think Sierra Club is interested in and we add to this, or maybe it takes something off. Uh, as I meet with Matt and the legislative team to discuss what issues Sierra Club wants to follow and and uh, indeed get involved in. So um, why don't we jump right in? Uh, the first, th these are bills that have been posted. That is to say, they're fully drafted. They've been assigned LD. That is legislative document numbers, and um, we can see exactly what they do in most cases. Uh, anybody is welcome to get this link. Um, I have an email that goes out automatically to clients on Fridays with a link to the client's report. If you're not getting those and you want them, let me or Matt know, and I'll add you to the distribution list. Um, so you had mentioned that uh, the interest is 50-50 on whether to take a look at the plastic bag ban or was it, I was so involved trying to get my technology straight here, I didn't catch everything you said. Yeah, that was for the bag ban or offshore wind, but um, maybe we could start with the hydrofluorocarbon and then um, if right. you want to be the vice president and break that tie, I'm happy to delegate that to you. Um, maybe somebody else will come on and take that responsibility. What bill number am I looking for here? Do you there remember the number? Two, the 226. I think you just passed it. All right, let me, let me go up just a little. Here we go. All right. So this is the LD number. If you can see my cursor circling around, this is the bill's title. And you can see that that's a hyperlink. This is the description of the bill taken directly from the bill. Uh, over, on the, over on the right here, that's simply when I last made a change to this entry. <clears throat> the status is it's simply pending final legislative action because there hasn't been much action. This is the name of the committee of jurisdiction. We do not have a hearing or work session date. So let's look at the bill itself on the legislature's website. We do that by going here, clicking on that hyperlink. So 
This is a page from what's called the bill directory. And there's quite a bit of information on here. If we want to look, see what a legislative document actually looks like, here's, here it is in PDF form. The format of the front page is always the same, state seal. We're at the beginning of the 130th Maine legislature, which will serve for two years, and then there's an election, and then we'll be going to the 131st Maine legislature in 2023. Um, this is a document number. This is when it um, first was reported to the House of Representatives and it went there first because its primary sponsor is a representative. Um, this line right here, submitted by the Department of Environmental Protection, would appear on any bill submitted by a department. Um, it has to be presented by a legislator and Ralph Tucker who happens to be my representative uh, submitted on the behalf of the DEP because he's the house chair of the committee that will hear the bill. And you see here that the clerk of the house has referred the bill to the committee on environment and natural resources, which Ralph chairs. And then we get into the substance of the bill. A lot of this will look like some sort of foreign language perhaps to you but it is adding a definition to some existing law. The, probably the best way to start is to go straight to the end of the bill where there is a summary, and then you get a better idea <clears throat> what the bill does. So we page down until we get to the summary, and I went right past it. This is it. And this is what the bill does. It prohibits the sale, lease, rent, installation, use, or entering into commerce of any product or equipment that uses or will use a substance that is a hydrofluorocarbon with high global warming potential intended for any air conditioning, refrigeration, form, or aerosol, propellant, end use, as determined by the DEP, it directs the DEP to adopt rules. And in adopting the initial rules, the department must regulate each substance and end use as specifically provided for in the bill and may not regulate any substance or end use not addressed in the bill. In the future, the department may adopt rules adding or removing substances from the list of prohibited substances or adding or removing end uses. But what does all that mean? <clears throat> I think it's fairly straightforward what this covers, hydrocarbons, um, with certain intended uses. The rulemaking stuff, um, that's pretty common, particularly with legislation that deals with a highly technical or complex subject. Rather than the legislature, the citizen legislator trying to figure out exactly how the rules should be written, they delegate that task to the department. Now, they can, the legislature, um, tell the department before the rules are implemented that they have to come back to the legislature for a review. They do that if they deem the rules to be major substantive rules. Um, and perhaps we can find up here whether they've done that. Rulemaking. No, nope, they did not do that. Look on line 13, rulemaking. The department shall adopt rules to implement the section. Rules adopted, blah, 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 are routine technical rules. <clears throat> See, there are two types of rules. There are major substantive rules, which come back to the legislature review and approval. And then there are routine technical rules that simply uh, go into effect once the department has conducted the rulemaking process a process which is prescribed in law. So um, let me, before I go any further, let's see if there are any questions or Matt, whether you want me to uh, steer this in a particular direction from here. Um, feel free to, yeah, if there are questions, you can put them in the chat. I don't see any at the moment, but um, 
Right. I, mean, I appreciate I appreciate knowing the distinction between major um, and routine technical major rules. Sub major substantive. Yeah. And it's strictly a, a call by the legislature which type they are going to deem a set of rules to be. My guess is they've done routine technical rules here because there's still there's already a very well developed set of rules. Uh, on um, on the regulation of uh, chemicals and substances, and this simply adds another category to it. It's not it's not a whole new area of law. So, what else strikes you about this legislation? Was this also um, was this given by the department or the governor? Yeah, this comes from the department. Uh, it's not a governor's bill per se. Uh, the governor can put in her own bills and she can do that anytime she wants. Whereas departments um, had a deadline in, I believe, early December. And then individual legislators submitting bills in their own right and not by half of the department or agency had a somewhat later deadline, 18th of December. Now, I will say the department is very unlikely to put a bill in without checking with the governor's office to make sure the governor is okay with it, but it is not per se a governor's bill. I think Minot had his hand up. No, you were batting away flies. <laughs> um, any, any other questions? Well, I guess this does bring up um, what Bruce briefly touched on, but the, the rulemaking process. So, I mean, this is legislation to change, um, change the law and then with specific definitions by the department. And then there, there is a rule, there are rulemaking processes for most agencies. Um, can you just give us a clear, a, try to understand the difference between rulemaking and the legislative process in this regard? Sure. Well, let's, let's start with the foundational governing document for the state of Maine, and that's the state constitution. Uh, everything flows from that. Uh, the legislature cannot pass laws that are somehow in conflict with the state constitution. Likewise, a department or agency cannot enact rules that are not consistent with the statutes enacted by the legislature. Uh, but assuming this bill, um, well, there's no question but what their rules are likely to be consistent with the intent of the legislature because they're being directed by the legislature to do this. <clears throat> there is a, quite a body of law, statutory law governing the uh, rulemaking process it's called the administrative administrative procedures act we could you know i could bring that up on the screen if anybody wants to get into it but maybe this isn't the session for that suffice it to say perhaps that um, the public has to be given notice of proposed rulemaking uh, there is often a public hearing i believe in all cases there is the opportunity to submit written comments, and then uh, only, and I believe that the agency has to respond in writing to each set of comments, and then eventually uh, they can promulgate the rule. And uh, it has the force of law. The, the difference, if this were deemed a major substantive rule would be that after they'd gone through that process, they, the agent of the DEP could not promulgate it until they had sent it to the legislature. And it essentially comes in like a bill and the legislature can approve the rule, they can approve it with changes or they can reject it. Pretty much the same options that apply to any piece of legislation. 
and all all those steps in great detail are set forth in the Administrative Procedures Act, and that applies to any agency that um, has rulemaking authority. And, and agencies need specific authority to adopt rules. Uh, if the legislature hasn't authorized an agency to adopt any rules, they don't adopt any rules. Okay, that's helpful. And um, I guess my only other question, I, I think I'm gonna send another quick poll out in terms of how many bills people want to cover or if they wanna go more in depth on this one or cover more bills. But I guess my only other question before that would be, what, what do you think of this legislation? Does this seem um, well-written? Does it seem likely to pass? What are your impressions? Um, well, the, the substance of, let, let, this would be a useful exercise. There's a little preamble up here, being an act of the people of the state of Maine as follows. This is a section number of the bill and it pertains to, this 38 here is a title number. The environmental laws are in Title 38. There are 40 some, I think, titles, sectors, titles, title numbers, number titles there. MRSA may, means Maine Revised Statutes Annotated, which is our code of statutory law. This little squiggly is the symbol for a section, and it's creating a new section entitled Hydrofluorocarbon Use Restrictions. Um, it defines the term substance. Um, I guess what I'm looking for, they don't, they don't in the bill define hydrofluorocarbon. It may be ad addressed in existing law. Then there's a prohibition regarding these substances. And then there's the rulemaking authority. So everything from line one to line 15 is new law. Everything else from there on, and, and you can tell that because it's underlined. Um, the rulemaking authority is not underlined. Don't mean to make folks dizzy here. Um, the rulemaking authority is not underlined because it's existing law, I believe, and we can check that by going, bear with me here. And Bob, as you do that, I'm gonna send out a poll because um, I mentioned earlier that this is kind of like choose your own adventure. We're trying to gauge your interest in what you all would like to get out of this. So um, I'm just gonna throw out a poll kind of wondering if we want to just focus on a couple bills pretty thoroughly like we are now or kind of roll through a few more um, and focus kind of just on the general overview content. So I'm just going to launch this, see what people think. But carry on, Bob. Yep. So um, I'm assuming you can see something that says Title 38, Chapter 16, Sale of Consumer Products Affecting the Environment. And these are all existing laws. Aerosol sprays, chemical septic tank cleaners, foam products, lead acid batteries, plastic ba bags are dealt, I think now elsewhere in law, motor vehicle air conditioning, wheel weights, lead in them, or used to be, ozone depleting products, bromide, flame retardants, upholstered furniture, electronic lead, Waste has been moved to another area of the law. And, oh yes, here's plastic bag reduction. So the, see that that last one is section 1611. The new one is 1612. So when this, if this is enacted, you go to this page and you'll see one other line here uh, below this one. But if we wanted to look at plastic bag reduction, we click there and it will take us to the current law on plastic bag reduction, 
just looking down to see if that contains its own rulemaking section. Um, I don't go too far down the rabbit hole. You asked me if this is well drafted. I, I think it's very well drafted in that is it's it's detailed to the nth degree. There's really not much question about what it does. Um, it's a little different than a lot of bills because of all of this stuff in here that deals with existing types of um, things that are regulated by the DEP as some degree of hazard. I'm guessing that might well be enough on this bill, but you tell me. Yeah, um, I think so. We got our poll result. Well, if you haven't voted, um, you, have, you have five seconds. Um, but we have definitely the majority of people have voted. And um, yeah, and, and just to before I show the poll, um, Isabella, our, our legislative team regularly dives in deeper. And um, I think our next workshop, um, I have to double check, but I think we might, we might also look a little bit deeper as well. Um, I think the goal, once we do a few of these, it'll make more sense. And you, even just reading the summary really helps. Um, but it looks like our polls with about two thirds reporting are to kind of move similar to this pace and, and focus on the, the few that we first um, talked about. So this one and two, maybe maybe three more if we can, but um, maybe the next one can be the pine tree amendment. And then if we have some time, we could just do both of those opposition bills, the, the ban and the um, offshore wind. So you're talking about the environmental constitutional amendment to establish environmental rights? Yes, I think it's 60, uh, it was 64 or five on there. Well, did I have, maybe I have it up at the top in the priority section. Yes, I do. Oh, 64, yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this will be a little different <clears throat> because it proposes to amend the state's constitution. <clears throat> so here you have the LD number. This is the title, brief description. It's going to, well, it's going to the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. That's interesting, although not terribly surprising. I would have thought, however, it would go to environmental, environment and natural resources. Let's click on the link. It'll take us to the bill. And um, we'll open the, the document itself. So, um, so you've seen the format title. Oh, now I entered, I entered the Committee on Energy Utilities, which was obviously an error. It's what I thought would have thought it was. So I'll go back and change it. Sponsor. So it adds a new provision to the state's constitution, Article 10, Section 26. It establishes certain environmental rights, which are set forth here. And then there's language that's unique to constitutional referenda that spells out the process, including how the question will appear on the ballot right here. Now, um, the, um, the only way the main constitutional can be <clears throat> amended is if the legislature sends a question out to the people. Uh, constitutional amendments cannot be initiated by the voters like statutory law can be. 
So, for example, we've seen citizen petitions on the CMP corridor and the returnable container law and any number of other things, but you won't see a citizen-initiated petition on a constitutional change. That's just a start in the legislature. And not only that, it's not easy to do this and it's intentional. It has, the legislature has to do this by a supermajority of two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, in order to send it to the voters. Um, like a lot of constitutional language, it's, it doesn't have a lot of detail. If this passes, no doubt you will then see pieces of legislation responding to this, perhaps to create some new rights that the Constitution guarantees or how to implement those rights. Um, not been scheduled for public hearing yet. As far as I know, we can go back to that page. And if one were to click on status and committee, no public hearings or work sessions have been listed for this bill. So <clears throat> these other links over here won't give us anything yet because the bill hasn't been heard. So no amendments been offered, no committee divided reports, nothing's happened in the chambers yet. That is to say the full house and Senate. The actions that have been taken it, that's it so far, referred to the committee. And I'll go in and change the committee that I listed on my report. I made a mistake. <clears throat> so any questions on, on LD64? I don't see any yet, but just to clarify, um, so this would need a two thirds vote of the legislature. And a, a, and a majority or two thirds vote of on the ballot. Majority of the voters, but two majority of the voters. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't see any others. I did just put a link to um, for a way to keep track of this specific <clears throat> campaign, um, and I did mention that. I believe there's another bill relating to this that um, is better in terms of what our our folks are interested in supporting. It's very similar, but um, that happens as well sometimes, right, Bob? I mean, there's can be competing bills of a similar topic, even for ones that amend the Constitution, and um, somehow. Oh, sure, because yeah. There's no, there are no limits on the topic or number of bills that can be put in in the first year of the two-year term. In fact, there are some exactly identical bills that have been submitted in, in the normal year, which this isn't. Um, the legislative professional nonpartisan staff would, would have those two identical bills combined into a single one. But COVID's changed the way a lot of things are done. And this office I refer to is called the Office of the Reviser of Statutes. They haven't been trying to combine identical bills. They're letting the committees sort that out. One committee had hearings today on two identical bills, but they'll report one of them out of committee eventually. Yeah, I'm not sure off the top of my head which the other you're talking about another proposed amendment to the constitution yeah and i'm not i'm not quite sure how um i guess it just hasn't been printed yet but it was introduced i think I, as an lr yeah um that's another thing we might mention briefly uh, on december 18th uh, the deadline for individual legislators to file a bill there are about 1600 had been filed and one can go and look at a list of the titles of those bills. Um, they won't all become printed documents. Um, and, and there's no particular rhyme or reason to when any given title 
shows up as a printed bill. It really depends upon when the revisor's office gets to it. But that process, bills will, will continue to, to emerge over a period of two or three months, maybe even four. Once they're posted like, like uh, well, let me, go, let me do this again. Once they're posted in this format, um, we will have a rules call for two-week public notice of the hearing. And one can get on a list. Each committee has a distribution email list for notifications of its activities, including public hearings. And one can get on that list. Perhaps, Matt, before we're done, I could do a screen share of the legislature's website and just point out a few things that I think are very helpful in trying to get information about what's going on under the Capitol Dome. Yeah. Um whatever you think, it sounds like maybe at the end, but I was just going to suggest maybe yeah. um, as a segue, you were just on that plastic bag ban. Maybe um, we uh, just hop into that and it would be great. It seems like timing is, is going okay, uh, but feel free to ask questions, uh, folks. Um, I think we still could cover that offshore wind repeal as well, because I actually haven't read it yet either, and I'd like to look at it. But... We just looked at a constitutional amendment. We looked at a department bill that defined hydrofluorocarbons and what should not be allowed. And now we have a bill that is trying to repeal a bill that was passed last time. Yeah, and I'm trying to get us to the law it would repeal Um, well, bear with me. And so you're All right. reading 1611 is the one I want. Just 1611, which is right here. So this is the current law. This is what the bill would repeal. First, you've got some definitions, including plastic, point of sale, post-consumer recycled material, so forth and so on. And then you've got a list of uh, the defined restaurant, retail establishment, what's a reusable bag, what's a single-use carryout bag. And then after the definitions, the prohibition the, and, and then exemptions from the prohibition. So this sentence here contains the prohibition. And then following that under B, a bunch of exceptions. A retail establishment may not provide a single use carry out bag to a customer at the point of sale or otherwise make single use carry out bags available to customers. But then here's a list of exceptions to that. Um, my favorite newspaper bags. We use them for doggy food bags, but that's all right. At least they get second, they get used, used at least twice. And then after these exceptions, um, a retail establishment may make single use carry out bags made of plastic that are exempted in paragraph B available to customers to bag products within retail establishment other than at the point of sale only if the retail establishment locates inside the retail establishment or within 20 feet of the main entrance of the retail establishment, a receptacle for collecting any single use carry out plastic bags and ensures that single use carry out bags made of plastic that are collected by the retail establishment are recycled or delivered to a person engaged in recycling plastics. Then you get into a section on fees. Whoops. Didn't mean to jump quite that far. Um, OK. 
Okay, so retailers may charge a five cent per bag fee if they use a recycled paper bag or reusable plastic bag. Um, and then an exception to the fees. So, um, We'll give you a little sense of what the current law is. There's no secret that some people didn't like that when it was first enacted. It was by no means unanimous. So we go back to the bill and it appears that what this bill is trying to do is to go back to the prior law because when the current law, this one, was enacted in 2019, it replaced this law. This bill puts that old law back and then down here repeals the current one. Um, and the old law said that a retailer may use plastic bags to bag products at the point of retail sale only if the retailer locates a receptacle and ensures that plastic bags are collected, or re recycled, or delivered to person engaged. So um, I think in the wisdom of the legislature, this old law was not sufficient to reduce sufficiently the number of plastic bags that end up in the trash, or on the streets, or on beaches, so forth and so on. Thus, this law. I dare say this bill will not pass, but we'll see. Um, uh, thank you. I'm um, responding to Mandy's question, which pointed out. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Um, I'm just responding to Mandy's question that there are actually three of those bills repealing the ban. And I um, I know you'll show it at the end, but I thought that was a good opportunity to use the site to search. So I searched plastic bag ban on that link I sent and I now see those three bills, um, LD39, which we were looking at, LD108 and LD244. And and um, 108 uses, you know, the language of public safety as um, to try to improve public safety. But I just wanted to point out, thank yep. you for bringing that up. There are a couple other bills in this regard, and um, we do track, we do track as many of these as possible. Um, so we will definitely be adding these to the list. This appears to me to be identical, except for the title to the first bill we looked at. Um, if I jump back and forth between the two, I don't see much difference. Yeah, that's an example of how the reviser didn't uh, screen out identical bills. Let's take a look at that third one. Yeah, and I'm, I haven't read through all of these. Um, Isabella just brings up if these are, if it is, has been effective or not. I, I thought there was an implementation piece. Maybe you covered it, Bob, of, um, I don't know if it's been phased in or if it is just a charge on plastic bags, but um, it is definitely an uh, interesting point about how to go about either banning or taxing. And sometimes I know for taxes um, or bans, I, I believe, I'm no legal expert, but the US Constitution sometimes comes into play with the Commerce Clause. So um, some, I don't know, if Bob, if you would agree with that, but I know sometimes people have to decide which way to go if you're kind of taxing or banning and um, it has, it can have bigger implications if they're national corporations. 
<laughs> well, yeah, and what you will sometimes hear on that last point is that, uh, oh, the state of Maine shouldn't do this. This really should be a national policy. So things are uniform from state to state. Well, guess what? The same lobbyists were in Washington telling the federal government not to do it either. <laughs> Now, we have three identical pieces of legislation. Um, we wouldn't have seen this before the 130th legislature, but um, blame it on COVID, but um, mm -hmm. these will be scheduled for hearing at the same time. The sponsors will all stand up in a single hearing, make their pitches, and the committee will, will kill two of the bills uh, they may kill all three of them, but, but they won't report more than one out. Great. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Mandy, and thanks, Isabella, for um, kind of pointing more towards how, how people are actually trying to address issues and are they effective is definitely um, something that we continue to look at for everything <coughs> moving forward. Um, I wonder if this is also, as we're kind of moving towards the end, if we could look at the um, offshore wind ban before we start finishing up. Right. Did you want to talk at all about ranked choice voting? Um, I not. I think that that one got the least amount of votes. But um, okay. Um, who, let, and then uh, let me give you let me give you fifteen seconds on it. Okay. Um, the reason this is a resolution to amend the Constitution is that ranked choice voting for the governor of Maine and the legislature uh, cannot be used because the Constitution says the winner is the one who gets a plurality. Uh, that doesn't that prohibition doesn't stand in the way of ranked choice voting for federal offices or for primary elections because those are actually party events. Uh, but to apply it to the governor in the general election, got to change the constitution. All right, Wynn, um, do you have the bill number off the top of your head? Um, I think it's one. I think it's one hundred one right there. Um, one hundred one. Yes, yeah. I did a word search on. Okay, so um, this, if you were to look at the sponsors down here, it's a very similar cast of characters that you will see on the plastic ban repeal. Um, and it's interesting, most of these legislators, well, half of them anyway, don't live near the oceans, but there's a couple of them that probably represent a fisherman, lobsterman. Anyway, um, here we go. We'll look at the bill itself. Um, so, uh, a fairly short bill. Let's let's go to the summary. It prohibits any department or agency or a political subdivision of the state, like a town or city from approving or permitting offshore wind projects. Um, and then it says that these various state departments have to submit by the end of this year legislation necessary to align those provisions of law under their respective jurisdictions with the prohibition on offshore wind development. And then it says what, what, what kinds of projects are these? include community-based offshore wind energy products, deep water offshore, uh, offshore wind energy demos, um, and, off and wind power projects. So um, not quite sure what their objection is. The, the, the strongest objections I think have come from people who fish for a living. And in fact, the governor is going to ask the legislature for 10 year moratorium on offshore wind that's within the three mile limit that the state regulates. Her proposal would not apply 
to things further offshore that that one needs only the federal government to approve. And she couldn't she couldn't do that anyway. She couldn't go beyond beyond three miles just for that reason. That's how far the state's reach goes. Now, uh, Representative Falkingham, he is from a coastal community, and he's the primary sponsor. So I'm sure he's hearing from his fishers, fisher folk. Um, Bob, I'm I'm pers I'm struck by um, I don't see any any reason uh, given you would think there in some defense in a court of law later. It would say, you know, in order to protect such and such, this is no longer allowed. But I don't see any reasoning in there. Do you? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and it's not necessary in order to enforce a law. The legislature can d decree that this can happen and that can't. And, the, and you may find a rationale in the legislative record, but you won't find it usually in the the law per se. You can bet that once this bill gets to a public hearing, um, in fact, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take the liberty of showing you uh, something from the last legislative session as an example of what you can find on a I'm just going to pick something at random here. Um, oh, all weather tires and automobiles, what the heck? So uh, I'm going to, what happened with this is that it was given, uh, that's not a good example because it looks like it never got a public hearing to sponsor. LTW means leave to withdraw. The sponsor withdrew it before it ever got a public hearing. Not a good example of what I wanted to show you. Um, septic inspection of the shoreland area. We'll try that one. Okay, this is this is good. Um, I, this is the status and committee page. The committee name, when it was reported out, and how. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, anybody, you all can submit written testimony for a bill and you can do it through a web portal. In this case, 20 people did so. There are their names, their affiliations. You click on the names, you can uh, see what they have to say. Very open process. You won't, you won't get anything like this from Congress. <laughs> But certainly not this this easy. So, Nick Bennett, staff scientist for NRCM, testified in support, gives his reasons. So you you can you can get to that question, Matt. What the basis was, what the reason was, uh, not so much by looking at the law, but at looking at what people said to justify the law. Um, up here, committees don't all, the 13 members of committees, we talked about this in earlier workshops, don't always agree. Uh, often there's more than one report, and indeed there was on this bill. The majority of the 13 supported the bill. Two of them didn't like anything about it and voted against it. You can then find out what happened when the bill got to the House and the Senate. It tells you when it was enacted, when it was signed by the governor, and what public law chapter number it was assigned. All right. I don't want to keep you too late. I'm good as long as you are. Where, where would you like to go next? Um, just to, I guess, answer Bruce's question, which is um, definitely a, a legal um, question in my mind. But he said, what is legislative intent? 
does it have any weight when rules are made or if there are disputes in the interpretation of a law derived from the bill? I'm sorry, say the last part about interpretation. I didn't miss the word. Does, it, does legislative intent have any weight when rules are made or if there are disputes in the interpretation of a law derived from well, the bill? The, the answer is yes and yes. Legislative intent has everything to do with how the rules are drafted. But yes, there can be disagreement over the intent of both the law and the rule. And that's why we have courts uh, to arbitrate those disputes and decide to di discern what the intent of the legislature was. And the courts can look at more than just the words of the law itself. They may very well go into the legislative history and look at, um, it's not the one I wanted to, I may have closed it, but I, we were looking at something a minute ago that showed uh, a bill from the last, oh, wait a minute, is this it? Yeah. The uh, the courts may very well look at this testimony. There is also something called the legislative record. Um, every single word spoken on the floor of the House and the Senate, at least when they're on the record and not talking about when they're going to meet for lunch, uh, is recorded and transcribed. And it used to be those, you could go to the law library and find those on hefty homes. Now they're online. But um, the debate on a bill um, is also very much uh, fertile ground for a court to try to discern legislative intent. And in fact, some, it's not unusual for a legislator, and it may often be the chair of a committee that reported the bill out is to read a statement into that record uh, to emphasize what the intent was and what the meaning of the bill is. So that's the kind of stuff the courts will look at in addition to, you know, the black and white words on the page. Thank you, Bob. And I, yeah, it does strike me that it's, as you said, it's still the judge's decision. And um, at least when I think of you know, other courts at the, the Supreme Court, they may or may not care about um, intent. So um, yeah, I guess this this was great. I, we covered, we got to cover all the ones we voted for. So I'm glad we could do that. I know a couple of people have um, jumped off. I think they probably had to leave right at the top of the hour. Um, so I'm gonna stop recording and so anybody who wants to receive the Friday reminder